Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining Active Aging in Manitoba for our Be Winter Active, Don't Hibernate presentation. Apologize for the couple of minute late start. Our presenter had a power outage, so had to uh, actually get home to do the presentation for us. So we apologize. I hope that you all received the message that we sent to you uh, via chat. So without further ado, we'll get started. I would like to, first of all, my name is Linda Brown and I work with Active Aging in Manitoba. I'd like to introduce our presenter, Barrett Miller, who is the Tourism and Customer and Programs Coordinator at Fort White Alive. Barrett studied psychology and forestry, but more importantly, grew up playing and learning in the bush around Pinawa, Manitoba. He's a former summer camp kid who's channeled his enthusiasm and love of nature into his work at Fort White Alive an environmental education organization in Southwest Winnipeg. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Fort White Alive. Now in his 15th year as an outdoor education professional, he plans and leads field programming for folks of all ages and ability, leads Fort White's ecotourism initiatives and has committed to nibbling every wild edible plant Manitoba has to offer. That's an interesting goal. <laughs> so Barrett, I will let you take it away thank, thank you. you thank you very much um, and thank you everyone uh, for um, attending today you know I was thinking about this as I was trying to navigate the Winnipeg roads as quickly as is safe to get here today a year ago I would have had to have been doing this from home for reasons of the pandemic now I have to do it from home because of a weather related power outage and internet outage and I got to say, wow, does that ever feel better? Um, you know, uh, so I feel actually quite privileged to have to come to you from my living room. Today. Anyway, without further ado, as Linda said, on with the Get Act, You Interactive presentation. Okay. So, here we go. For those of you who aren't familiar, Fort White Alive is an organization. We're not just the land in Southwest Winnipeg. We're dedicated to providing, I'm not gonna read this uh, verbatim, but we are dedicated to getting people playing and learning outdoors. And as we do so, it's pretty hard to play and learn in a place and not develop some attachment to it. And from that attachment to that one place, not develop some attachment to the entire outdoor natural system. So that is what we do. We are very gifted to have um, 660 acres in Southwest Winnipeg. A lot of that is former industrial and um, farmland that has sort of been allowed to come back to me from a very human influence past to a very natural state now. Um, that lovely picture of the lake sort of shows that. But that's not really what we're here about today. Um, I'm here to encourage everybody to get playing outside a little bit more and how we might go about doing that and why that's a good idea. Uh, Linda did a great job with the introduction, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, except to say that, um, you know, I do, um, I do have all those credentials that she mentioned, and I do, one thing that I never really thought I would end up doing when I went into the environmental and outdoor education field was work right across the spectrum of ages. I thought this was mostly kid stuff, to be honest. Now, 15 years ago when I started at Fort White, I definitely identified more with the kids that I was working with at the time too. Um, I've seen things change um, in how I interact with the outdoors over the last 15 years. Some things that were really easy to do are starting to get a little bit less so. I've had to change what I can do. And as the clients that I've worked with have changed, so has my approach that way. So everything in this presentation has been tested in real life. I feel that's always important to mention because I hope you haven't run into presenters or advisors in the past who sort of, oh, well, you know, this approach is great because they read it in a book somewhere. I love theoretical learning, but when it comes to getting active outdoors in the wintertime, um, tested in a Manitoba winter is pretty important in my book. So a little bit of reassurance to everybody, I hope. Why am I here today? Well, more than anything else, um, it is true that uh, 
the more we are outdoors, the healthier we will all be. This is a very early winter picture. Um, Linda, did something happen there? Sorry. Is everything yes, okay, Linda? Just uh, give me a no. I, don't I don't think, think we're seeing, seeing your slides. slides. Okay. Is that better? Oh, okay. All right, let's see. No. Okay, um, are the slides back? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't, I don't believe we're, we're seeing, seeing slides. slides. All right, sorry, I will try to fix that <laughs> right away. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Better? No, we're seeing no. Okay. Sorry, folks. Um, all right. There we are. There we are. I can actually now see what you're seeing. Sorry, I figured that out. Anyway, this picture is an early winter picture. Uh, you can tell because there's still liquid water. Um, this is a multi-generational trip down the Assiniboine River. Uh, and... We did it actually to celebrate the return to health of the fella who's sitting just in front of the person in the canoe um, that you can see there. Um, they had been very, very ill, and um, part of celebrating their return to good health was getting outside. One of the things that they'd missed most, they were told that they weren't actually supposed to continue outdoor activity for a while due to a health stress. And they really, really missed it. Nowadays, I feel that we would have been told maybe to go outside. Um, I'm not sure if anybody saw this, but uh, right across Canada, this is from the CBC and CTV a few weeks ago, right across Canada, doctors are actually prescribing time outdoors to improve people's mental and physical health. The benefits of being outside, some of this comes from an educational study in Scotland, actually. Folks who are outside more often, tend to learn more effectively, retain information more effectively, um, understand material better. The Scots don't mince words, they say they're smarter. Folks are definitely physically more healthy. Now, some of that has to do with the um, exercise associated with being outside, but even if all your access to outdoors is, is getting out, it has a real impact on our physical health as well. There was a study done in Tennessee originally and replicated in Texas actually, where uh, abdominal surgery were able to see a green field or a brick wall from their hospital room. And the folks who were just able to see outside, the folks who were able to just see outside, not necessarily get outside, but see outside, did better. They got out of hospital faster. That points to this next thing. Folks who have access to the outdoors, folks who play outside, learn outside, are just mentally more healthy as well. There's a theory that we we evolved in the natural setting. You know, we didn't evolve in square boxes. We are primarily forest and grassland critters that have opposable thumbs and big brains, and we've managed to build an environment that we think is what we need and definitely makes us comfortable. But we also still need that wildness to sort of tap into all parts of our brain and make us as healthy as we can. The idea of connection to a place, whether that's a very temporary thing or a very long lasting thing, folks who feel a strong connection to place tend to do better over the long run, tend to see less cognitive decline as they age, tend to feel more connected to their human neighbors as well as the natural place. Um, this is actually a snowshoe hike or some older adults. Um, I'm the one who's loaded up at the front of the group like a pack mule. That uh, backpack has more hot chocolate blankets in it than you can imagine. But it was part of making that group feel quite comfortable as they went. Um, that's actually in a place that I'm very connected to. That is the Old Pinawa Dam um, Provincial Heritage Park near, uh, well, halfway between Pinawa and Lacrimonia. It's interesting because a lot of those folks were very, very hesitant uh, to even leave the perimeter, but once we got out, everything had been planned to be as safe as possible. 
And once we got out, it was great. Folks really opened up and had a good day. Um, anyhow, we see this in kids too. We've actually launched in the last 18 months an initiative called Strong Roots for youth from the inner city where they get to come to Fort White, develop some of that connection to place and play outside. Um, these are kids from right downtown in the inner city. They lead lives where they encounter things that I can't even imagine. Um, we've had stories about, hey, were you at school the day the guy came in and tried to grab Lisa? Not actually Lisa, pseudonym to protect anonymity. Like, oh no, no, no. My dad passed out, so I couldn't make it to school that day, but I heard it was crazy. That's the kind of conversation that we overhear. These kids come into Fort White just dazed by their day, and they leave after being kids in the forest for 90 minutes, feeling better about things and thinking about a different kind of living. Tales Along the Trail, we launched this fall. It's a program for adults experiencing early signs and symptoms of dementia and their care partners. And um, it was supposed to be a six-week pilot. It was a six-week pilot, but uh, at the last session a few weeks ago, the group gave me no option uh, but to run a winter version and actually encouraged us to double the amount of programming that we do that way because they felt it was so therapeutic and useful and fun. So there's now going to be a second session of that offered as well as a second session during the second session by popular demand. So we see that it works at that local level too. We see that it works with real individuals that we get to know on a first name basis. It's not just all statistics from a research center somewhere that's not Fort White. One of the most important things about getting out there is feeling comfortable to get out there. How can we stay safe and comfortable no matter what age we are when we go out? Now, you might not realize, but as folks age, you actually have a lot more in common with the under five crowd as well as the winter. Uh, older adults and little folks lose heat more quickly and generate heat less efficiently than young adults and middle-aged people. Our senses change as we age. Generally, we would say that maybe they're not as sharp. I don't know about that kind of language, but our senses change, and we need to be aware of that. And as bodies age, they heal more slowly. The consequence of an injury, a little bit of frostbite isn't just a little bit of frostbite. Um, a stubbed toe or a sprained ankle can have some more serious consequences as we age. So we need to start planning. We need to plan a little bit differently to try to mitigate and make sure that some of those things that we might have been able to slough off don't. Now, if we're making heat less efficiently, if we're retaining heat less efficiently, it's going to be important to generate heat. Here's how. Feel that burn. We generate heat as people by burning through calories, burning food energy, um, and circulating that around our bodies. I once got to sit in on a session for Frontier School Division. And that's a school division that goes all the way up to Hudson Bay and basically covers all of the non-urban and not even really highly populated rural areas of Manitoba. So I got to hear the phys ed teacher from Churchill talk about taking kids winter camping. Um, they were suggesting tips like, oh, you know, hot chocolate is good, but if you put a little bit of cream in there, it's even better. Add butter to your oatmeal. Now, I'm not suggesting that we throw every dietary rule out the window just because it's winter time. But when you go outside, a day like today, not super cool, but a little windy, just going outside today, going for a walk, you will burn about half as, again, as much energy per minute outside as you would walking on a day where it's 15 above and beautiful. This means that you can eat a little bit and you should eat a little bit more energy. So before you go outside, make sure that you are fueled up. Good, stick to your ribs kind of food. There's a reason that comfort food is winter food. Um, the difference is if you're winter active, you can eat it and then burn it and not have to worry about the consequences. Generating that heat, getting active, keeping active, whether that is something like shopping or whether it is a sport, once the fuel's in, you have to keep that fire going. Once that fire has gone, how do you keep the heat inside? Well, there's heat thieves that are trying to steal that from you. 
respiration, when we breathe out with every breath, we lose a little bit of heat. People are actually very inefficient this way. Um, our noses are relatively small for our lung capacity. Think about a horse or a moose, big, long snout. Now, their lungs are bigger too, but one of those reasons that animals have big, long snouts is to actually capture some of that heat as it leaves the body. We don't have that advantage. Um, apparently, we're better at diving into water than most mammals, so I guess we can take that. But we do lose a lot through breathing. What can we do to compensate for that? Less than about these other things. Evaporation. If you are wet from sweat or water, water holds... Water has a heat capacity about 10 times that of just the air around us. That means if you're wet, you get cold about 10 times faster. Staying dry is key. Heat radiates away from our bodies, away from our skin. Um, if you've been outside in the cold, uh, where that's not a surprise. Convection, air moving over the skin. So wind, even on a nice clear day, calm day, any sort of air movement, if you're running, you can actually run and feel cooler riding a bike. There's a reason that biking, you can get colder than you are running. It's that convection. The movement of air across our bodies is another heat key. Conduction. We don't tend to think about this one until you sit down on a cold bench or even better, a cold rock. And all of a sudden um, you feel that, ooh, that doesn't feel good, ooh. Um, contact with a cold surface will actually draw heat away from our bodies very effectively too. Water holds 10 times the heat of air. Something solid like concrete or rock, it can be a lot more. How can we? What is our security strategy against those heat thieves? Face coverings. Now, that's the least important thing that we can do to sort of stop heat from getting out of our bodies. But a face covering on a very cold day does actually stop the heat loss from that respiration. It's interesting, my four-year-old nephew was just out at my parents' place in Pinawa a few weeks ago, and as he got ready to go play in the backyard, he dug a face mask out of his pocket. Now, my mom was, oh, Wyatt, you don't need that. Uh, you're just playing outside. There's nobody else around. It's like, but Nana, it keeps my nose and my face warm. And she sort of chuckled and it's like, well, okay, yeah, we could just put a scarf on. Oh, no, no, this is easier than a scarf. I can do this myself. So, you know, wisdom out of the word, word, mouth of a four-year-old there. Maybe they have a use beyond um, just pandemic-related um, uses. Evaporation, sorry, I keep switching slides there. Evaporation, if we stay dry to begin with, if we dust snow off, uh, avoid activities that are going to get us wet when we don't have a warm-up spot. Uh, I told a group of children that I was working with on Monday, don't roll in the snow until the afternoon. I don't want you rolling in the snow in the morning because you're going to get wet early. I'm not against rolling in the snow. It's a lot of fun. But if you roll in the snow at the end of the day, if you plan your activity to get wet at the end and then warm up, a lot more fun than having to dry off in the cold. Breathable clothing and being aware of sweat are key. Dusting snow off before you come into a warm-up space so you don't melt and get cold. That can be really, really, really helpful. Breathable, waterproof clothing costs a little bit more than just waterproof clothing, but it is worth its weight literally, well, not literally because gold would be very heavy to wear, but it's worth its weight in gold metaphor. Conduction. Insulate with layers. One big, thick layer, if it gets compressed, becomes one thin layer. It's hard to compress multiple layers of clothing. I actually experimented with this last month. Um, as October got colder and colder and colder, my tendency over the last number of years at Fort White, though I know better, has been to trot out my winter parka. What I found was several thinner layers really still does make a difference even though that's what the evidence said i had to prove it for myself again lots of layers you stay warm lots of layers you can open it up uh, you can always drop a layer if you don't have a layer and you find that you need one it's a lot harder to add something you don't have to protect against radiation you know wow i kind of sound like a 
1950s uh, civil defense film here. To protect against radiation, just add layers. Um, now, of course, that is radiation leaving your body to the atmosphere, not atomic radiation, but uh, same sort of principle. You want to put some layers between you and that. Convection, windproof is key. You'll lose a little bit of heat if your clothing is loose and not windproof, as air will still circulate through your insulation. Putting that windproof outer layer on, make sure that circulation stays inside your clothes and doesn't cool you off too badly. Um, I should mention, please feel free to put questions in the chat. Does anybody have a question right now? Are we good? It's making sense. Okay. Good, good. Back to that injury prevention bit. Um, good grips, walking sticks, and using gravel and grits. Slips and falls are a common winter injury. Slips and falls, as people age, gain consequence. Now, I actually have had younger friends than I am hurt quite badly in slip and fall incidents on sidewalks, on driveways, and the like. I am a big believer in the tracks that you slip onto shoes. They're making them easier to put on. I know um, Yak Tracks was one of the first brands to come out. Yak Tracks have gotten better, but it used to be adding that layer of grip to a pair of shoes was quite difficult. You had to really be, you needed very good fine motor control. You had to really know your shoes, you had to really know your grippers. And um, they actually made smooth surfaces indoors slipperier than not wearing them at all. Now, I don't necessarily recommend wearing outer grips on indoor surfaces, but newer ones don't cause concrete and vinyl pouring to become very, very slippery. Walking poles can add an extra upper body workout element to any outdoor adventure, and they add a layer of balance and stability. When I take folks who maybe have had hip or knee issues out snowshoeing, I definitely recommend that they use hiking poles or ski poles as that added balance. And again, it does really add to the workout if that's what you're looking for. If you're not looking for the workout, it actually takes impact off your lower body. Around home, I know nobody likes tracking gravel into your house, but having a little bit of sand or grit by the door, making sure that you're doing everything that you can do to clear the ice off of where or to make the ice less slippery where you are and that you have control over is important. And it's funny, in Wilderness Guide, and we talk about route finding, picking the safest route, I have applied that on city sidewalks and parking lots far, far more than I've been able to in the bush lately. Kind of makes me sad, makes me want to get outside of the perimeter. Uh, but I also do have to say that trying to find that route where the grit is on a sidewalk, trying to avoid the icy areas, it's not always possible, but it is an extra extra thing that we can do to look after ourselves our, as we're outside. General safety for any outdoor adventure at any age. Always file a trip plan. Now that doesn't need to be anything formal, but let somebody responsible know where you're going and when you plan to be back. Your trip plan, where you're going, who you're with, your approximate route, and your approximate time of return. Um, look at the area before you go, whether this is just walking through a local park or whether this is a wilderness adventure, making sure that you, you know the area. What are the alternate routes? Um, if I get to the park and the trail I want to walk is blocked by snow or ice, is there an alternate trail? Could I just stick to the roadway and make my loop? Knowing that is very important going in. Whether, again, we're talking about a big adventure or just a small little local route around the neighborhood. A communications device is your most important tool. Being able to ask or request help, being able to let people know that you're having such a good time, you're not going to be back on time, and that is okay, that is planned. Um, communications tools have made outdoor recreation far, far more comfortable and safe in the last 20 years. Now, there is an argument to be made for sometimes just completely disconnecting. I would say 
you need to have a communications plan in place if you're going to disconnect. Uh, if you're heading out, especially by yourself or with a small group, a cell phone, um, if it is a little bit more of a distant wilderness adventure and the cell phone range isn't great, a personal locator beacon, these things have made outdoor adventure far safer. My own grandfather, uh, we gave him a personal locator beacon for his 80th birthday. That let him, we, we weren't always the most comfortable with this, but it made his family and it made him feel comfortable going out on his own or with my grandmother um, to do things like, oh, find a bucket of sand from a local sand pit or just drive down a bush trail that he used to go hunting on. Um, having that communications tool, he would have never used a cell phone, but the locator beacon that he never actually had to use, that was okay. Um, the way they work, if you pull or hit the button, it sends a call for help. Newer ones, you can actually send a, a couple pre-programmed messages to trusted cell phones. So minor help, like, hey, I got the truck stuck. We could then go and help. So that's an example from my own life of definitely using that communications technology to help somebody enjoy active outdoor winter activity well after maybe he was comfortable doing on his own without something. I keep on saying on your own or in a small group, there's always safety in numbers. You can send folks for help. You can help out one another. Grouping up is always better than going it alone or in a pair. It's amazing how going outdoors in a group also brings you closer together. When you've had to loan somebody a pair of socks, you're friends for life. If you have been on the receiving end of that, you're friends for life. Now, I do recommend carrying an extra pair of clean socks for that. It's not really all that comfortable to borrow a used pair, but I digress. If you are just looking to get out and explore your neighborhood a little bit more, six steps to the perfect nature walk. You need to recognize there's one big world out there, and all it takes is your two feet to carry you there. Three steps. I see, I hear, I smell, sometimes I even taste, or I feel some factor of that natural world. I see a blue jay. The next step, I think it's looking for food. The third step, I wonder if that means a storm is coming. I sense, I know, I wonder. Um, this is something that I do with students, with kids all the time. I never really thought about the applications of introducing it to any of the adult practices. And then it just sort of came out of nowhere during an eco tour. And wow, folks loved it. It really does engage you wherever you happen to be. Whether your nature walk takes you past a couple of shrubs at the end of your inner city block, or whether that natural area extends from your location all the way to the shores of Hudson Bay, those three steps I sense. I know, I wonder, really do get you in awe and wonder of that natural world. Knowing your directions, not just because it helps you from getting lost, but just knowing where you are, where you're going, and becoming aware of the patterns. Sunrise in the east really does influence the pattern of animals moving. Weather moving from west to east helps you know what's coming in six or seven hours by looking at the sky. I am a modern person of science. I do know that there are more than four elements. The Greeks didn't have it exactly right. But thinking about the effect of wind on the landscape and water, fire, water as ice, um, seeing things grow, it, it's kind of a neat sense and it connects you to the natural world on a longer scale than just your short little visit. Using your five senses and looking around to see how the life around you is meeting the five basic needs, those being food, water, air, shelter, and space, can really help you understand what's going on in any sort of natural area. And recognizing that there's really six seasons here in Manitoba and trying to figure out how you mark time as you go. Um, the six seasons model, uh, I learned it first from a Cree teacher 
I've later found out that it's actually pretty universal around the world in cultures that are fairly connected to the land in the latitude that we live in. Four makes sense a little bit further south. Um, the lap of northern Finland actually recognize eight different seasons. Two are classic spring, winter, summer, and fall. We add ice in, which would be the season that we'd be in now, things freezing up, and ice out. Ice out is that season, well, here in southern Manitoba, when the leaves are on the trees, but the river is still threatening to flood, uh, and there's still very much ice around, but everything else is cleared. Um, I had ice out explained to me as the water's too thick for paddling, but too thin for walking. So ice in is when that's forming, ice out is when that's leaving. If you are looking to turn any little trip outdoors into a nature walk, using these six steps will get you there. Practical tips for staying warm as you get outside, stay winter active. Fuel up, that's why we have the GORP there. Um, GORP, nuts, raisins, and candy. Doesn't just taste wonderful, there's a reason for that. The nuts are protein and more complex carbohydrates. They're going to provide, and fat actually, they're going to provide long lasting fuel. They will keep you warm in the long run. Um, the dried fruit, the raisins in the mix, uh, frankly, it's fiber to offset the nuts. And it's also some sugars, but also some complex carbohydrates. They're sort of your mid range fuel. And the candy doesn't just make it taste good but it's short burn fuel. The sugar acts quickly. A handful of candy, dried fruit, and nuts is the perfect mix to keep you going for a long period of time outside. Now you can substitute things in and out of that. You can find foods that work similarly, but it is a really ideal mix. The sweatpants in the center of your screen, if you don't have all of the winter gear you need, um, or if you're new to being interactive with winter outdoors, if you're not quite sure that you want to make the investment in all of the proper gear, but you do want to get outside, here's the thing. A pair of sweatpants over top of your regular pants, maybe even a thicker pair on top of that, acts almost like a pair of ski pants. Layer up. Many layers that aren't designed for winter can add up to a pretty decent set of winter clothing. Now, you will be puffy, but think about proper winter clothing, you're pretty puffy anyway. If, like me, you wear glasses, uh, and you still want to be able to wear glasses outside in the winter, if you have problems with fogging up, they actually make, and illustrated there are, a pair of ski goggles meant to fit over corrective eyewear. I just found out about these as I researched this presentation, you better believe that they went onto my wish list that I sent to my uh, family uh, for the upcoming holidays ASAP. Uh, I've always recommended some sort of goggle or sunglasses that fit over top of corrective eyewear if you need them. Now knowing that they're sort of a little bit more mainstream and easier to find, definitely recommend that. Wool socks. Wool is a neat material, even if it gets damp, whether that's through foot sweat or melted water, whatever, it still keeps you warm. Um, a pair of wool pants, a wool sweater, these are great things, those get itchy. Wear them on top of some other layer, like long underwear, polypropylene, uh, even cotton, even though cotton isn't great for winter. Uh, so long as you layer up over top of that, it's okay. Wool socks, it's sort of one of my trademarks. Uh, in fact, I new staff at Fort White make fun of me for wearing my wool socks as much as I do uh, until about, well, we've had snow on the ground for about a week and the tune changes about a week after snow is on the ground when they find themselves scrambling to buy the last pair of wool socks in Winnipeg and recognize the wisdom in socks that keep you warm even if they're a little bit damp. Um, I do have a couple pairs of cotton socks. I do have a couple pairs of dress socks to wear when I absolutely have to. But working outside every day with folks in an unpredictable climate has made me such a huge believer in wool socks. That's about 90% of my sock wear right now. The tinfoil. 
this is a very, very cool trick, and I learned it from some very, very cool people. Um, I actually was host to a group of teachers from Santa Kilowack, Nunavut, uh, in 2017. For those of you who are trying to figure out where Santa Kilowack might be, as I was when they approached me to be their host in Winnipeg, Santa Kilowack is uh, a community located on the islands where James Bay meets Hudson Bay. It's sort of equidistant to the Ontario coast of Hudson Bay and the Quebec coast of Hudson Bay, right where James Bay sort of lets out into the main bay. Uh, they laughed when Winnipeg had a wind warning and the wind hit 75 kilometers an hour and when we had a cold weather warning and the temperature hit minus 30. That was sort of their, well, yeah, I guess it's starting to get to be winter. Uh, and for us, it was the, this is absolutely, we need, we need the red level warning because it's that much of a winter. Santa Kilowack is dependent on ships coming in in the summertime and otherwise supplies being flowing in. If a person puts a hole in their rubber or in their winter boots, if a person loses a boot, if the boot kid outgrows a boot, if the weather's not great, it can be two or three weeks before that boot arrives and you live on an island in the middle of Hudson Bay. You need to be able to have a backup plan. Boots, the way it was taught to me, boots can take a long time to come, but there's always tinfoil at the northern store. If you take a piece of tinfoil and step on it and cut out that footprint and put that in the bottom of a pair of running shoes and put your wool socks on top of that, your feet will stay about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than if you wear the running shoes with cotton socks. So from your sort of classic gym jogging, I'm just going for a walk around the block setup to winter gear, wool socks and tinfoil together turn a pair of never designed to be winter boots, running shoes, into not the world's best winter boot, but a pretty good stopgap until you can find something better. So if you ever find yourself in that situation, if you're, again, not necessarily wanting to go with a full, odd, big, triple layer Sorel boot, you can try that trick. I mentioned the grippers. Um, can't say enough about that. There's a lot of equipment now that's been adapted to be easier to use with mittens on, and that means with lower motor control. That means with less bending over. Uh, my dad actually switched, with my advice, his snowshoe bindings from a very difficult old style binding to snowboard bindings recently. That's what's illustrated on this slide. Most of the older adults I've worked with find the new fancier, uh, that's what they call them, new fancy snowboard style binding far easier for skis or snowshoes than other binding systems. They work better with gloves on, they require less bending over. The easier it is to just get out and do something, the more likely you are to do it. Uh, the palm, that blue thing in that hand, is actually a reusable hand warmer. I eschewed the use of hand warmers for a long time. I couldn't figure out what they were actually useful for until I talked to some of my friends in the fire paramedic service. What they explained is, no, no, that's not for keeping your hands warm. That's for warming them up after they've gotten cold. If you have to work outside of your gloves, like to put on snowshoes, like to tie a scarf on a four-year-old, you have those hot pockets, the hot shots in your mittens to replace the heat that you lost. If you're counting on those to keep your hands warm, you're probably already compromising on keeping your hands warm, period. And if those don't work, you're in trouble. But for short times out of your gloves, putting them back in warm gloves can work really, really nicely. Mittens versus gloves. Mittens are always better. They let your fingers snuggle together and share body heat rather than being separated and all on their lonesome trying to stay warm. Um, I do love a good fermented barley beverage around a campfire in the wintertime as much as anybody. But uh, the classic take a flask ice fishing because it keeps you warm. Drinking in the cold, especially as we age and our bodies metabolize alcohol more slowly, it's not a great idea. Alcohol is a diuretic. It drains water from the body. As it drains water from the body, that water needs to be heated, so it's draining heat. 
It opens the blood vessels near our skin wider, so we actually radiate heat faster. Um, the little flush that you get from taking a stiff drink in the cold is actually heat leaving your body faster, tricking your nervous system into thinking like, ooh, my skin's warm. So for a brief period, your skin does get warm, but it actually drops your core temperature as it slows down other aspects of your metabolism. That metabolism that you're counting on burning food to stay warm. So um, if you are one of those folks who enjoys a good drink, inside at the end of the day after the outdoor adventure is over, once you're off the roads. So I, I'm not the fun police on this one at all, because again, it can be pretty nice, but there's a time and a place. Now, the slide at the bottom, if you have to go, go. If you have to use a washroom, doesn't matter where you are, go. Carrying extra fluid around in your body, your body needs to keep that urine warm. Now, the heat loss through keeping urine warm isn't great. But combined with all those other heat thieves, it can actually drop your core temperature a little bit. It's better to just get it out if you can. Um, and right now, given the situation we're in with the pandemic, yeah, it doesn't really matter what kind of washroom, who you are, where you go, just wash your hands after. Any questions on those tips? These are, again, not just sort of made up. These are things that I live by and make my life outdoors, winter active, easier. Not seeing anything in the chat, um, I'm going to move along. We've just been through the first good dump of snow of the season. Ah, I read some studies out of uh, the Mayo Clinic that do actually indicate it's not just a myth that heart attacks increase when uh, uh, people are shoveling out after a snowstorm. It is very much a fact. Now, risk factors that predispose one to heart attack for cardiac issues anytime they might physically exert themselves definitely are a factor of concern but just generally it's one of the times where most folks are most active outdoors in the winter to shovel safely warm up stretch you don't need to go through a full stretching routine but a good couple body bends even doing a couple presses with a shovel before you start a couple turns will make shoveling more comfortable and will make you less sore the next day as well as warming your heart and lungs up to do the job. Um, I couldn't help myself but for this next uh, one. Uh, steady small scoop speed snow cessation saving seconds setting celebrations soaring sooner. Thank you for indulging me on that one folks and it's true if you watch a professional snow clearing crew where they can't get machinery if you watch them work they're not moving the most snow humanly possible using a huge scoop shovel. Just like the fellow illustrated there, they often have a small grain scoop or garden type shovel, and it's lots of little shovels, and the job gets done faster. Um, if you start at the top and work your way down, if you treat it like you're digging a hole, not clearing a pathway, if you go slower but quicker, if that makes sense. Smaller and slower actually makes the job faster in the end. It's sort of a tortoise and hare thing. Hare is trying to push that giant snow scoop and throwing 40 pounds of snow a time. A bunch of little scoops are going to get it done faster and keep you safer and more comfortable. If you breathe in as you lift rather than <gasps> throw, I can breathe again. You're putting a lot less strain on your lungs and heart. Um, being somebody who's genuine, generally pretty cardiovascular healthy and needing to prove this point for myself, uh, during the dig out on Friday, I did a couple pulse tests as I was digging. Um, generally, needing to breathe during short bursts of exercise, lifting, are something that I sort of need to remind myself to do anyway. I'm very bad for going to the gym, trying to lift weight, and like, It's not good. It's not good. It puts strain on your body that doesn't need to be there. Uh, the difference between shoveling small scoops and breathing while I lifted and trying to do a big scoop and like <coughs> and then breathing was about 20 beats per minute, which is pretty significant. So it, it is good advice. 
If you don't feel good, stop and rest. If you really don't feel well, don't be a hero. There are other people around who will help you out. If you have to get somebody else, if you have to pay somebody else to shovel out your walk, shovel your driveway, if there's a neighbor with a snowblower, take them up on that offer. Um, I know there's been times I absolutely wrecked my back once, um, and I did. I paid the neighborhood kids to shovel my place out, and it felt a little bit tough, but I also realized that, you know, what I just paid the neighborhood kid, I'm going to save and not needing to go to the physio because I wrecked my back on top of wrecking my back by shoveling. Um, my grandmother has made a very similar observation. It's sort of like the, I would rather pay somebody $25 than have to, uh, you know, spend a night in the hospital. So if you don't feel good, stop and rest. If you still don't look at, if you don't feel good about shoveling, don't feel that you need to. There are other ways to get outside and winter active once that big job is done. And plan shoveling just like you would any other adventure. Fuel up, dress for the job. Let somebody know that you're starting the job and let somebody know when you're done. Um, I once, living in a different part of Manitoba, came across somebody who'd actually slipped and fallen while they were shoveling their driveway. Uh, he was in cardiovascularly good shape, but he really, really hurt his ankle quite badly in the fall. And this gentleman was sitting at the end of his driveway, sort of perched up against his shovel in clear pain, waved me over as I was walking by. Um, it was getting to the point where he couldn't take the pain and his rear end was getting very, very, very cold from sitting on the uh, concrete. And I guess at the time I had a little bit more hair and looked a little bit younger than I did now. In his words, I looked like somebody who might have a cell phone. Could I call his wife? He wanted to surprise his wife by having everything shoveled out when she came home from shopping. Only she wasn't due home from her shopping trip with friends for about three hours. He thought that he was just going to wait it out and sit at the base of the driveway for three hours. It's like, oh, dude, no, I'll definitely call somebody for you. Plan it like an adventure. Now, skiing, snowshoeing. Going out and tracking through the Great White North, that's not going to be for everybody. I'd like to suggest a couple alternate outdoor adventures that might motivate you to get winter active, get out there and try something new. Some relatively low impact things, some things that might, you, maybe you do already, but maybe you haven't before. Of course, the scene here, skating on the ice, that's a pretty classic outdoor activity, but again, it's not going to be for everybody. The first one birding. Oh, I swore I would never be a birder. Um, I thought that birding was an old-fashioned, you know, like who goes bird watching? Old people who wear a lot of tweed. Not knocking older folks who wear a lot of tweed. I have come to appreciate it as a fashion uh, style and I've come to appreciate birding as a pretty cool activity. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. If that's the motivation that you need to get outside and start interacting with nature, and maybe it's not birding. As Linda said in my introduction, um, I really, really like wild foods. Now, you have to be a little bit more careful. The consequences of misidentifying a bird. You know, I'm not going to give myself three days of stomachache by saying it's a fox sparrow when really it was a house sparrow. With wild food, you need to be a little bit more on point with your IDs before you eat a plant. However, um, that's part of the beauty of it. You can get out, you can make rookie mistakes and learn from them. It's a very forgiving hobby. Generally, the community is very welcoming. If you happen to find somebody in the community who's not very welcoming, find somebody else who is. Nature Manitoba, um, the Manitoba Trails Association, uh, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, Fort White Alive, um, Okamak Marsh, these are just a few of the places that you can start to get into birding. Um, I don't recommend the field guide to dumb birds of North America as your first field guide, but if you are a birder and you like slightly off-color humor, it's an amazing, amazing book. If you are looking for birding resources, by all means, please reach out to Fort White. I'll share my contact at the end of the presentation, and we can get you started. 
Christmas bird counts are coming up in a couple weeks. This is a really good chance to get together outdoors and distance with people who know what they're doing and are really willing to share with folks who are just starting. It's a neat way to mark the start of the holiday season. And there's one happening in just about every corner of the province you might be joining from today. It's not just an urban thing. There's great ones out in the White Shell, out in the Southwest, out up the west side of the lakes, up in the interlake, up in northern Manitoba. Maybe birding's not your thing. Maybe you'd like to stay active. Maybe you enjoy a good game of golf, but figured that it had to be over when the snow comes. There are now more disc golf, frisbee golf courses in Manitoba than ever before. If you've never frisbee golfed or disc golfed, it's essentially the same rules as the game of golf you play with a ball and clubs, but greens fees. In Manitoba, I've yet to find a private course where you need to pay to play. Generally, they're on publicly accessible parkland. So now there is something to be said for a good, super well-maintained golf course where you're the first person out there in the morning. You got that perfect tee time. You have to work a little bit harder when it's public access, but you can still find that. Um, around Winnipeg, there's at least four or five disc golf courses that are accessible all winter long. La Barrier Park being one of the better ones because just the way it's out on the prairie, the snow doesn't pile up as much. Um, I know that Brandon has recently opened a new one. I know that there's one in St. Agathe that's absolutely great um, that just opened up. So they are around. Uh, you can get special discs special frisbees for disc golfing. They're different weights, just like the clubs in a golf bag. We'll go different distances and are designed for different styles of shot. But your 30, 40 year old frisbee that came free with a bottle or with a six pack of Coke back in the 70s or 80s when they were trying to you know, squeeze out their competitors. Um, that frisbee that's left over from Canada 125, 25 years ago, any flying disc will work. So if you have a Frisbee, and if you don't have one, you know, the price of everything is going up, but they're only $2 at the dollar store right now. It's a very financially accessible sport. Um, it's a good, the, um, you know, I forget which famous comedian it was, but the definition of golf is a good walk ruined. I find that disc golf is actually, oh, it's a good excuse for a great walk outside. If you've never tried it, it's something to try, and why not try it in the winter? You go from being a rookie at this sport. Most disc golfers haven't actually done the winter thing yet. You go from being brand new to being one of the top winter disc golfers in the province. You'll get immediate respect from anybody who plays the sport because, wow, they're going out in the winter? Oh, they're hardcore. That's amazing. So give it a shot because there's a course nearby, and it's a great excuse to get out and enjoy some winter time. This is actually an idea that I got from a friend of mine. I'm not sure whether it's her original idea or not. I can say that that is um, a picture from another friend who's done this. 100 days. The cold season in Winnipeg in southern Manitoba feels like it lasts a lot longer than 100 days, but really, the average for snow on the ground is right in around that 100-day mark. The challenge that she put to herself was 100 days, 100 walks, and one photo per day. Part of the challenge was really deciding what that one photo a day would be. Um, it doesn't have to be long. The definition of a walk in this case was at least 150 meters from the front door, and it had to be outside for at least five minutes. So it was a really cool project that she embarked on. She did accomplish that, 100 walks, 100 photos in 100 days, and that record of it um, has lasted now years. It's a really neat thing to try. It's a bit of a challenge, and um, setting that goal really does motivate to get outside. Become a tracker. Learn to read the landscape around you. Um, there's track guides available from your library from bookstores. Fort White actually has one that you can download off our website that's accurate for the southern Red River Valley here. Um, you don't need to be a grizzled mountain man to enjoy tracking. All you need to do 
is start by reading a few little traces. It's like learning to read or teaching a child to read. If one track is a letter, two tracks become a word, and that trail becomes a sentence. What story did that animal write? And you can allow yourself to be creative. It's a neat way of interacting with the landscape. I happen to love brewing on fires in the winter time. Just getting friends around a campfire. Cooking, maybe it's just s'mores, maybe it's a fancier meal. But doing a little bit of cooking outdoors on a campfire connects you to our past, connects you to bigger outdoor adventures, and brings people together. Campfires act as a focus point for community. You can't have strangers around a campfire. You can just have friends that you haven't got to know all that well yet. And like I say, um, maybe limit yourself to one brew around that fire, but you can make a lot more to enjoy indoors later if that's something you're interested in. Gathering around a campfire gets you active outside, gets you people knowing one another better, and you know what I've found around the fire lately has felt like one of the safest people to gather in community. You're sort of naturally spaced out. Everybody's sort of masked up to stay warm. And you're sharing something together that you wouldn't be able to share otherwise. Write your own trail tales. There's lots of walking trails around Manitoba that are kept clear for the winter. Not just in the urban area, all around look online call recreation departments rural recreation departments uh, either have this posted on their websites or are more than happy to share the location of the best walking trails in your area um, more and more planning is being done to get people out and active on those trails find one and write your own trail tale as you explore the neighborhood nature in your community um, I'd like to open things up to questions. I recognize because we started a little bit late, we are getting past one o'clock, but if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them now. And if you do have to go, please do, uh, if you do have questions, please do grab that email address, emailer at fortwhite.org. If you're interested in any of the resources I offered up around birding or tracking, pop me an email and I will have that back to you in your inbox as quickly as I can. Hopefully the power's back on there soon and I can get those. Um, and I mean it, the more people get outside, the better off we all will be now and in the future. So I'd like to open it up to questions um, if you have any. All right, I am you, going Sean. to pause sharing. Okay, thank you, Barrett. Thank Barrett. you that was a very interesting presentation, especially on the kind of day it is today. We do recognize that we started a bit late, and I appreciate everybody's uh, participation and patience as we got going a little bit late. Everybody will be able to get a late recording of this webinar, and certainly you will have uh, Barrett's contact information and our contact information for Active Aging in Manitoba. As, an, As a, a nonprofit non organization, organization, we strive, we strive to provide healthy opportunities for older Manitobans. So, so we really appreciate this information, this Jared, so, so we can encourage people to stay active all winter. winter. Some, Some great, great ideas. ideas. And I'm just going to check and see if there are, there are any questions, questions before we sign off. off. Uh, question, question here is about Four White Alive. Are the walking trails cleared off? off? And is and the is cafe, cafe and, the and the gift shop, shop open? Okay. Uh, the walking trails, our main trail is cleared. Um, our site crew is working to clear our side trails. So the main trail being the one that goes from Sterling Lion all the way through to McGilvery Boulevard from north to south. Uh, also known as the storied People's Trail north of the gift shop and the Lakeside Trail south of the gift shop which is open. The gift shop, the Alloway Reception Center is open. Um, it is a public space, so masks are required inside. Uh, there is no check on vaccination status in that building. The cafe is not open right now. Um, unfortunately, due to 
the problems that the restaurant industry is experiencing with the pandemic and supply chain issues, our caterer partner has had to pull back. Now we are looking at different options to get that back open in some capacity as quickly as possible. And if you are, if you do have an event booked at Port White Alive, don't fret, catering arrangements have been made. Nothing has changed because of that, except daytime cafe service. Um, it is a little bit beyond our control and we're working to do what we can to get that back open, but that is the answer right now. Everybody, if you are wondering what was going on with our interpretive center renovation, I'm happy to say that it's almost done. I'm happy to say that there's going to be a big announcement about that building in the next few days. Watch for that opening up very, very soon. I can't actually give you more uh, right now except um, to watch. And I personally look forward to welcoming more of you in that building very, very, very soon. Um, all of the exhibits that folks have come to love over the years, like the Touch Museum, like our aquarium, our soil diorama no longer talks about what might happen in the future time of the 1990s. It talks about what's happening in conservation now. Um, and it's sounding more and more like I'll be able to welcome you in that near future to see some of that. So that's a little bit of a status check on many things at Fort Wake, but thank you for that question. That's great. That's thank great. you, Barrett. That's, that's very, very exciting. exciting. Thank you. Be sure, sure to stay, stay tuned, tuned to hear that, that announcement. Um, um, what, are what are your hours, hours right, right now at Fort Wake? We are open nine to five every day. Uh, we will be open for a half day, that being nine to one o'clock on the 24th of December and the 31st of December. We are closed on Christmas day. Um, apparently once upon a time, three ghosts visited our CEO and convinced him that we needed one day off where nobody came to work in a year. And uh, it's the 25th of December. Uh, we are open for anybody who wants to get really winter active at a reasonably early hour, but anybody who wants to be at Fort White at 9 a.m. on New Year's Day, I will be there to welcome you. Um, please note that it does open at 9 a.m. And I know that resolution runs are a thing, but maybe you can keep your winter activeness at Fort White within that nine to five. Um, I could never figure out the folks who showed up right at first daybreak, right at seven o'clock to try to go for a run on New Year's Day. Uh, no knock on them. I admire it, but at the same time, mm, yeah, we're open nine to five on New Year's Day, and I would love to welcome you during those hours. Uh, extended hours will probably begin again around the end of May. We tend to extend a little bit into the evening just because weather's nicer and there's more folks on the trail. That's great. Thank you for that update and something to look forward to in the new year, that's for sure, to come and see you on New Year's Day. I don't see any other questions. Uh, just let me double check here. We just have uh, uh, some thank yous for some great outdoor winter tips. So thank you very much, Barrett. That was very informative. And uh, at Active Aging Manitoba, we look forward to working with uh, Fort White Alive again in the future. Certainly if you have any questions, our contact information is there and you will be receiving the link to the recording. So be sure to share that with friends and let people know about some of the information you learned today. And by all means, stay active this winter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda, and thank you everybody.